Hi, this is overview video for chapter 10, Direct Current Circuit. In the earlier chapter, chapter 9, we introduced the current and Ohm's law. Now, in this chapter, we'll employ those in circuit analysis. Let me go over each of the sections and what you should focus on. Section 10.1 gives a realistic description of battery. While an ideal battery would be one that maintains a constant voltage across its terminals, very few real-world batteries would be able to do that, especially as you draw currents out of it. So a real-world battery is modeled this way. An ideal voltage source connected in series with a register. This is called internal resistance and this models a real-world battery fairly well with the correct value of the internal resistance. So if you look at voltage changes as you go around the circuit, you will see that as you go across the battery, the voltage rises. In this model, the voltage first rises up to the ideal voltage source voltage and then drops a little bit across the internal resistance but none of the points A through C are accessible to a voltmeter. So a voltmeter sees an overall voltage rise. And then along the wire, the voltage doesn't change. And after a register, the voltage drops. And at this point, the circuit is complete and you are back to the starting voltage. We'll look at this in a little more detail in the following sections. But first, section 10.2. Registers in series and parallel looks at some of the simplest arrangements that we can analyze in circuit. These are registers in series. These are registers in parallel. The definitions here are important. Registers are said to be in series when current flows through the registers sequentially. That means current, once it flows through one register, it has to flow through the next register and so on. If there's another path for the current to go in, then they are not in series. Registers are said to be in parallel when one end of all the registers are connected by... Um, so what all this means is that voltages at one end of registers are all the same and the voltages at the other end of the registers are also all the same that gives the same voltage drop, and that allows you to make some simplifications and derive this formula regarding how the resistances combine. When you imagine the possibility of replacing these registers with a single equivalent register. Now, these two tools are powerful tools. Analyzing registers as in series or in parallel and there are register addition formulas you can use and you can apply these in steps. You can simplify a circuit a step at a time. Registers in series and then registers in parallel and then registers in series again. There are many circuits you can solve using this approach. However, it will not be the case that you can analyze all circuits using this approach. So, for more complicated circuits, you need a more generalized problem-solving approach. That's what the next section is about. Section 10.3, Kirchhoff's Rules, covers the generalized problem-solving approach that can be used to solve any circuit. It starts with the simple rules, junction rule and the loop rule. Junction rule says that all the current coming into a junction is equal to all the current going out. That's simply stating conservation of charge. And Kirchhoff's loop rule says that sum of all the voltage changes around the loop is equal to zero. So we call them junction rule and the loop rule. I hope these rules make sense. You've seen some aspects of this before. Junction rule is simply saying charges are conserved. And the loop rule is saying that, well, what you saw before with the um, analysis of the voltage change as you go around the loop. 
These rules are used in the following systematic problem-solving approach. It's a detailed problem-solving approach, and the end goal of this approach is to come up with a system of equations with enough equations to be able to solve for the unknowns. There are some intuitive sign conventions regarding how voltage changes as you go across a register or across a battery. And like with any systematic problem solving approach, it is important to follow it step by step. So do read through this section of the textbook carefully. There is also a lecture video posted illustrating these applications of Kirchhoff's rules in three different contexts. And in this particular example, the end result has been equations 1, 2, 3 through the use of junction rule and the loop rule on two different loops. And the rest is just algebra. Well, maybe not just algebra. The algebra can get tediously long. So this would be an excellent chance to get some practice in doing the algebra. There are more examples in the section. So please do give it a careful read through. Let me describe the remainder of the sections in chapter 10. In section 10.4, you get a description of the voltmeter and ammeter. You have seen this in the lab and make sure you are familiar with them. And section 10.5 covers something we'll just briefly touch on and come back to later when we do time dependent circuit more properly. So for the time being, please give it a brief uh, skim through. The reason we are going to come back to it later is analyzing an RC circuit properly in the fully time-dependent way involves calculus. I know you are fully able to do it, but since we'll be seeing other circuit elements later on that also require use of calculus to treat them properly, we will treat all those time-dependent circuit elements together later in the semester. Finally, chapter 10.6 deals with some basic common sense things that's good to know. <laughs> you may be tested on some of these in multiple choice section of your test, but beyond that, um, this is just something good for you to know, not exactly a circuit analysis. So that's it for the chapter 10. Uh, message me if there are any questions, and until next time, bye.